Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Revolution Northern Virginia's meeting. This meeting is being recorded. I'm Sandra Clausen, the meeting moderator or NOVA chair, Bernie 2020 Virginia campaign co-chair, and 2020 and 2016 National Sanders delegate. I want to thank you for joining us today. We hope to see you at future meetings as well, and we invite you to become active voting members or allies of ORNOVA. Voting members are defined as those who reside in jurisdictions CD8, 10, 11, or Prince William County 1, have attended a minimum of two previous organizational meetings, and have completed our membership form at www.ourrevolutionnova.com. Allies don't have to live within the eligible jurisdictions, um, but will receive information and invitations to attend our meetings. We are an issue and policy, not an operations focused organization. We're committed to advancing the progressive vision and ever evolving movement sparked by Senator Sanders' presidential campaigns and his current work as Senate Budget Committee Chairman. The objective of this movement has always been to advance bold policies grounded in economic justice and to reform those rigged and predatory aspects of our economic, social, and national security systems that impede these policy goals. Tonight, we're here to examine how Big Pharma controls where and how much COVID-19 vaccine is produced worldwide despite governments having provided billions to create the vaccines. Also big tech having launched a major global trade pack sneak attack to kill initiatives worldwide to break up monopolies and protect privacy. Then we're going to examine the assault on WikiLeaks founder and journalist Julian Assange for publishing state secrets that revealed evidence of US war crimes in Afghanistan and Iraq. And we're going to take a look at the US military buildup that began in early in the Cold War that was based on deliberate systemic deception that formed the basis for all US administration and ally military action since then, and how to use as activists the big lie of this to move forward in fighting it. Now, our meeting will be structured as follows. Each guest speaker will present in-depth remarks about their topics followed by a Q&A. During each topic presentation, meeting attendees are urged to please write your questions related to that topic in the chat. Steering committee members will be monitoring the chat and will ask the speaker your questions. Let's begin the program. Our first speaker is Public, is, uh, public Citizens Global Trade Watch Director, Lori Wallach. Lori is a 30-year veteran of congressional trade battles starting with the 1990s fight over NAFTA. She was named to the Politico's 50 list of thinkers, doers, and visionaries transforming American politics for her leadership in the Trans-Pacific Partnership debate. Lori is an internationally recognized expert on trade with experience advocating in Congress and foreign parliaments trade negotiation, courts, government agencies, the media, and in the streets. She combines a lawyer's expertise on the terms and outcomes of agreements with insight from the front lines of trade debates. Lori worked as a congressional staffer in election campaigns and in television news before graduating from Harvard Law School. Lori will address two topics followed by a Q&A divided into two segments, one on each topic. So please write your questions in the Q&A during her presentation. Uh, Lori, uh, are you back yet? I know you had an important phone call. Uh, are you back with us? Thank you. Over to you, Lori, to talk about the vaccine access battles. Please unmute. Wonderful. Thank you very much for inviting me and for being such a great champion uh, on all of these issues and bringing all of your colleagues uh, from Northern Virginia into really interesting debates and actions. So Sandra, thank you very much for your leadership and for inviting me. And thank you everyone for being here tonight. 
I am, I'm going to cover two topics and they are both sort of cutting edge breaking issues. If you care about how corporations want to use, really abuse trade agreements and trade policy, rig them really to exert power really unrelated to trade. These would be two topics that are going to make your blood boil. So the first issue is something that's obviously very close to home for all of us, and that is the way Big Pharma has rigged trade agreements to be able to get special monopoly protections that now are part of the reason why there aren't enough vaccines globally to actually stop the pandemic. So this is an issue about a waiver of World Trade Organization rules that are called the trade, the trade Agreement on Trade-Related Aspects of intellectual property. It's called TRIPS for short. This is waiving these rules in the WTO that require every signatory country, of which there are almost 160 around the world, to guarantee pharmaceutical corporations monopoly control over how much and where vaccines, COVID vaccines, treatments, and diagnostic tests can be made. In October 2020, South Africa and India started a movement to use a particular WTO rule, which is called a waiver for emergency purposes. If this ain't the emergency, I don't know what is. And within short order, uh, South Africa and India had 60 developing countries in favor. The Trump administration, not shockingly, was the leader in blocking this. The WTO works under consensus. The Trump administration organized a handful of very powerful other countries to block consensus. And this effort that would have allowed the information necessary to make more tests, treatments, and vaccines to be accessible for production around the world in this emergency temporarily. It's a temporary waiver. This was blocked. And when Joe Biden took the presidency, um, it suddenly became worthwhile for people in the US to try and campaign to change that. Obviously, Trump wasn't going to budge. So a really exciting campaign was geared up, it involved the major um, health groups like Partners in Health and Doctors Without Borders and Health Gap, and then development groups like Oxfam and a lot of the faith denominations, Christian, Jewish, and others, as well as consumer groups like Public Citizen, where I'm working. And we basically worked in a campaign to get the public and really importantly, Congress, very focused on trying to get the US position in favor of the waiver, not blocking it. And by the time on May 5th, that the Biden administration decided to support the waiver, reverse Trump's self-defeating blockage, there were half the House members in favor of this. And that was amazing work that activists did across the country, district by district. Members of Congress got in a letter, said basically, Mr. President, please, you promised when you were a candidate, you wouldn't allow pharma monopolies to get in the way of the world having access to these vaccines, and we want you to deliver. So the good news is that immediately following the US position change, a bunch of the countries that Trump had ginned up to help block switched sides. And some really excellent work was done by the very smart, excellent woman who is the trade representative, a woman named Catherine Tai. And uh, in short order, a group of countries called the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Bloc had joined the US. So countries that had been on the Trump no way, no how team like Australia and Japan, Mexico, Canada and others came to the side of the US and were in favor now of the waiver. And so the great news was within a month, by the beginning of June, there are 140 countries that wanted the waiver. The bad news and why we need to do more campaigning is that the Biden administration hasn't really stepped up since then to lead the negotiations. And into that vacuum, the European Union, led by Germany, is now single-handedly blocking the entire damn thing. So instead of now having this waiver and having companies starting to like get the money together to actually make more vaccines and get the factories going to make more tests, et cetera, instead, we have the European Union basically split. France is for the waiver, Germany is against. That's why there was so much activity when, when the German Chancellor Merkel was in town and there was a lot of pressure on Biden to make her do the right thing and join him. He didn't, sadly. <laughs> so while the EU has been busy trying to mess the whole damn thing up and keep the blockage, the US has not been leading. 
So going forward, a whole new campaign is ginning up. It's going to start basically now in August recess. And the mission is basically Joe Biden, deliver on your promise. And here, ladies and gentlemen, is the reason this is so important. This is not just a do-gooder thing, though, yes, tens of millions of needless deaths are going to happen around the world. Here is the straight skinny. We are kind of sort of, until Delta at least, starting to feel some level of anxiety going down. A lot of people want to get vaccines. If you want a vaccine, you can get a vaccine. A lot of people here have gotten vaccinated. We've had something like inching towards the semblance of life as normal up until Delta came. We thought kids were going back to school. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't. But we have the vaccine so that when and if you get the Delta virus, if you're vaccinated, you don't die. You feel bad that basically people in hospitals who are dying from COVID now are people in the US who volunteered not to get the vaccine. This is an anomaly. And our news coverage in the US is not making it clear. There are scores of countries where not a single shot has been made available, not a single shot. There are most countries in Africa where there is 1% or less vaccination. It is the opposite of here. People will die to get a vaccine. They are not saying, eh, I don't think I'm gonna do that. People are lining up, people are begging. People are literally dying for the lack of vaccines. Throughout Africa, Latin America, and most of Asia, healthcare workers, 100% unvaccinated. So the, the World Health Organization issued a report last week as Delta is ripping through Africa, deaths are increasing 40 to 50% week on week. So what we saw in the press in India, where the Indian government had not done the work to get enough vaccines made, they were allowing vaccines to be exported to Europe, which already had plenty of vaccines that were being made in India, the kind of death and disaster that we saw there on TV is what's happening now growingly. I mean, right now it's saying Indonesia has been ripping through other parts, Pakistan, other parts of Asia. China has its own vaccines. It's doing fairly well. The vaccines aren't as good as far as the level of protection, but between being 70% effective or 60% effective, and of course, the world's dying for any vaccine. And what is the US doing not leading to get our super duper mRNA vaccines made? So here's the bottom line. The industry every year promises, we're gonna do what you need. In 2020, they said they were gonna make enough vaccines so that they could start 2021 with 5 billion doses ready. They did not have a billion ready. So now they're saying they're gonna make 12 billion doses. Ladies and gentlemen, we are on our way to August. That is you know, the eighth month of the year. And we are, if we're lucky, around about right now, maybe three and a half million doses. So maybe by August one, we'll be at three and a half million doses. Yes, there'll be exponential growth, but right now, the way the data looks, we're actually on target given a variety of the vaccines that have been tried are not working at all and are not gonna be produced that will have maybe 7 billion. 15 billion are needed to vaccinate the world. So we are in no place close. And if we start having boosters and people here start taking extra shots, which is Pfizer's goal, be able to get rid of the pandemic pricing of 20 bucks a shot and charge 150 a shot for boosters, then the money's gonna go the shots are going to go where the money is. And so we'll be having people spending a lot of money here to buy boosters and even less will be going around the world. It's not just a goody two shoes, care about people in other countries thing. This is life or death for us. We are one variant away from a variant that's not just more infectious, but that absolutely breaks through the vaccines. So these variants build in each other. So we've had a variant that was more infectious. Then we had one that was more virulent. Now we have one that is built on top of that that's really, really more infectious. All we need is one more or two more or five more mutations. And everyone who had the shots is gonna to have to get revaccinated because we'll have a vaccine that actually can go around is vaccine resistant variant. So for all of us ever ending the damn pandemic, the whole world needs to get vaccinated. Because otherwise, there are always any place COVID is raging is where a variant is brewing. And we have to shut it the hell down if we're ever going to end this and have it just be a thing that like the flu pops up. Yeah, there'll be bad places. It's not going to go away 100%. But if we want to make it not a pandemic, but rather be a thing that is endemic, that can be treated, that can be controlled, the whole world. Otherwise, we'll be chasing. It's a race, ladies and gentlemen, between vaccines and variants. 
And if we never get enough vaccines to stop all these new variants, we're always gonna be one variant behind. So this is a huge emergency. The Biden administration's international coordinator for all of this and domestic coordinator, Jeff Zients, has really dropped the ball. There's no plan to force the companies to make more to send there, to give money to have more manufacturing there. And both of those require the IP waiver at the WTO. So the ask for this one is going to be a big alert, a big, and we're trying to get our revolution nationally involved. It's gonna be a big global national push of a petition, letter writing, et cetera, targeting the Biden administration to step up, get this leadership, unblock the EU, and get this waiver done so we can get more vaccines made and into arms. Item number one, how to stop the COVID pandemic by getting the WTO TRIPS waiver and getting the vaccines made. The way these TRIPS rules work, just be very clear, they literally require every WTO country to stay in handcuffs. It requires that they guarantee pharmaceutical companies long monopolies for not just patents, but copyrights, trade secrets, what are called industrial designs and data exclusivities. These are the different kinds of instruments. They're like barbed wire that the, the pharmaceutical companies have built a web around the vaccine so that they cannot be made by anyone else. The waiver just takes the wire cutters into that whole thing and removes the barbed wire, chucks it aside, lets the stuff be made, over time, when it's not a pandemic, the barbed wire comes up. Different discussion if that's a good idea, not the question at hand. Emergency temporary waiver, we can do it. Item number two, which is what will happen in big tech, like Big Pharma's done, if we don't get ahead of it. So Big Pharma got those anti-free trade rules, because if there are any economists out here and you're going, wait, the WTO has rules that require every government to guarantee um, monopolies for one protected interest industry. Isn't that the opposite of free trade? Isn't that like requiring rent seeking as an economist would say a special deal for one industry? Rent seeking monopolies isn't a free trade agreement. Like aren't the philosophers of free trade like a David Ricardo and Adam Smith rolling in their graves. So now big tech is trying to do the same thing. So what big tech is trying to do is what big pharma did in the eighties, where they got this not free trade stuff into a trade agreement. So it's enforced internationally and every government is in handcuffs. And that is the big tech industry is now trying to push what they have rebranded as digital trade rules or a digital trade agreement. It is nothing but an effort to lock up all of our governments here and around the world to make sure that these industry in that these big tech platforms can't be regulated. So you may have seen in the press in the last couple of weeks this push by a corporate group. Well, the US isn't in the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Thank you, Northern Virginia activists. You were part of making that a success. You helped save us all. So we should have a digital trade agreement with those countries just so we all get together and have rules together against China. Then you look under the hood of that, like what's a digital trade agreement? So ladies and gentlemen, this is what it's about. It's rules that forbid a government from regulating an online entity based on its size or the kinds of services that provide. So it's anti-antitrust. So just as the Biden administration is gearing up this big push to break up the big tech giants, to make them competitive, to make them stop cheating brick and mortar companies, to make them stop cheating the other online companies, to stop this monopoly, which is bad for the economy. I mean, there are conservatives who are for this because they want the markets to work. You, you don't have a functioning market if you have a monopoly. So the rules are anti-antitrust. You can't, you can't regulate on the basis of size or break things up. Number two, you can't limit data flows. Well, all right, that sounds reasonable. You want data to flow, except ladies and gentlemen, that's where your privacy protections come in. So the European Union, which is head and shoulders above us in, in protecting consumer data control and privacy, they have rules where you can't transfer your data unless it goes to a place that has similar levels of privacy protection and, re and redress. The third thing is no rules on anti-discrimination and algorithms. So there's a lot of racial, gender, and other discrimination in algorithms. This would ban any rules having to do with that. And the fourth thing, it, it requires that there is a waiver of liability. So you, you always hear the stories about someone buys something on Amazon, it burns down their house, and you can't sue. 
That is something called Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act that pretends that these platforms are communications platforms, not Airbnb, a hotel company, or Lyft, a car, a, 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 a transportation company. And so these things basically would be imposed in every government. And then what big tech wants to do is make sure they can't get regulated domestically, even though Congress at this moment in both sides of the House and the Senate, Republicans and Democrats, and around the world as well are scrambling to regulate. So look out for that sneak attack. And the first thing that's happening there is a huge US sign-on letter organizationally. And we'll be looking for chapters of groups like yours to be signing on. Thank you very much. Lori, um, would you like, you? Ha we have a lot more time if you would like to uh, elaborate because you transitioned into your second topic from the first one. We were gonna give you 15 minutes to elaborate on both of them. So would you like to say more? We have the time. Absolutely. I thought my cue was at my, oh, my time was up. No, your cue was the cue for topic one. So okay. go right into more on topic two. Please okay. feel free. So just to be more detailed about how this works, because a lot of people hear this, including members of Congress, and they say to me, what? How can that possibly be? First of all, as someone who has frequently brought these issues to the public and to Congress before they are known, and typically I'm told I am crazy, wrong, etc. In this instance, we have the smoking text, which is to say that a text leaked. So you can, if you Google WTO, and they, in this instance, they call it instead of digital trade, they call it the e-commerce agreement, WTO e-commerce agreement. You, will, you can look at the lack, leaked text and you can see, I ain't making this stuff up, sadly, I wish I were. But also you can actually look at the text of the USMCA, the NAFTA replacement, the US-Mexico-Canada agreement. There's a chapter called Digital Trade. Trump slipped a bunch of this stuff into that agreement. It wasn't in the original NAFTA. It was pushed into the TPP. The US didn't ever get into the TPP. So these outrageous rules weren't there. The way it works is that each of these trade, trade agreements have a rule that requires every country to conform their domestic laws, regulations, and administrative procedures to the trade agreement rules. And then if you don't, you're in violation of the agreement, you can get sanctions. So what, these, what, what the big tech guys are trying to do is what pharma did 25 years ago, which they're trying to get rules that have nothing to do with trade. Like this is called digital trade, but it's a brand. It's basically a way to do the classic look the other way. So if the international agreement were called the Facebook, Amazon, Google agreement to make sure we don't get regulated or broken up into competitive units <laughs> agreement, everyone would say, that's a really bad idea. We're against that agreement. So they're calling it digital trade because <laughs> digital is beautiful and trade is for smart people. And this is the same Trojan horse stunt that pharma pulled off with the trade related aspects of intellectual property. Doesn't that sound like a reasonable thing? Like they weren't saying they're like, hi, we're going to have the lots of extensive monopolies that make your grandma's medicine too expensive for her to afford it and kill many people from HIV AIDS as in 20 or 30 million because we're not going to have antiretrovirals agreement. Obviously, if it had been named properly, people would have realized sneak attack. This is what big tech is now doing with the digital trade agreement. So they all have a provision that says the countries have to conform their domestic laws to the requirements in the agreement. And then the agreement has all of these regulatory handcuffs in it. And so all of these things that Congress is working on this very moment become violations of these obligations. So imagine like a form of international preemption where a country that does the best stuff gets smacked down and a country that hasn't really done much, the US, never gets to get out the door because this sort of ceiling of you can't regulate gets put down in their, on, the, on Congress's heads, on state legislature's heads. So our mission on this is to make sure it doesn't happen. And what's, what's the big problem is most members of Congress and most activists have no idea what this is. So probably a lot of people on this call know what investor state dispute settlement is, ISDS, because you're progressive activists and you know from Bernie Sanders and from Elizabeth Warren that ISDS is a terrible corporate power grab and it was at the heart of TPP and we got it out of NAFTA which was like a great progressive victory yeah. and nobody knew what ISDS was 10 years ago and that's how it ended up in a bunch of these agreements 
So that's where we are with this digital trade stuff. So you guys need to be the folks bringing it to other organizations, bringing it to members of Congress. Let me explain practically what this kind of language does. So assume for instance, that something like Uber or Lyft, which right now is operating without meeting any of the rules, wants to, a government wants to regulate and say, hey, you're a transportation company. You have to have hours of service so that your drivers aren't driving hours that make it dangerous for them or the passengers. You have to pay social security and do withholding and all the other things that any other company would. You have to help with insurance, whatever are the rules of the country for transportation companies. That's what these are. These are not communications platforms. These are transportation companies. Under these rules, it would be a violation of the trade agreement to try and make the online provider have to follow the same rules as the local big, small, mom, pop, national transportation company. So that you would have these multinational companies basically able to control worldwide and you would have no regulation applied to them. And if this sounds too far-fetched, I'm sad to say that there is already um, at least one case in the US Columbia Free Trade Agreement where the government of a Colombian large city tried to regulate Uber and Uber is now using ISDS to demand millions in payments saying we're a communications firm and you are censoring us by making it a condition of our operating to have to meet hours of service and have to pay social security. So this is um, really very scary. And everyone who is a uh, veteran of the TPP will, this will sound very familiar to people because it was the same idea in TPP where the idea is to do this sneaky international preemption and um, to do it in a way that basically is branded differently. So the, the, the biggest thing we have to do now is what I jokingly call the Dracula strategy, which is we just need to get the sunshine on this beastie, make sure a lot of organizations understand because obviously labor regulation, not just gig economy workers, but broadly. So, you know, if you're trying to organize in the sector and the online competitor can basically say, no, you can't organize me because, you know, we have these rights, we're, we're digital economy. As well, anyone working in the civil rights movement who's been working on online discrimination, but also hate speech issues and incitement, racial incitement, all of those issues, total handcuff of government action in those areas. Anyone who's been working on pro all these horrible cases of product liability, of fake stuff, of dangerous stuff being brought in and inspected, this is your issue. There are a lot of people who have lost their homes, have lost their health, have lost their have lost limbs over the stuff and they can't sue, they can't do anything because it's online. Anyone who works on local government issues and knows what a revenue suck this is, part of this agreement is to forbid any taxation of these imports. They get treated separately, I'm sorry, of these products if they're sold online, most of which are imports. They also dodge around all the trade enforcement rules. They're called de minimis imports. They're under a certain value and they come in without inspection for safety, but also without really any of the penalty tariffs collected if there's been trade cheating. So, and then fi finally, if you're, you know, if you care about the data, which right now, when you use Facebook or you are, you know, Googling, what the companies see of value is the data. It's tracking you and then selling that to marketing firms for advertising, for sales. And that data, your private data right now, if you're in the US, is a totally unregulated free-for-all of commodities that the fact that, I mean, most people don't realize, but think about it. You could be on Google searching for some thing you're worried health-wise is happening to you. And you start searching your symptoms to figure out what your diagnosis is because you can't see the doctor for a couple of weeks. And then the next thing you know, you're getting advertisements for treatments for that thing. That is not a genie in your computer. That is that data that quickly being sold to let those pharmaceutical companies know that you think that you may, you know, really scary. That can't happen in the EU. Anyone who's ever li lived in Europe, that kind of, we commodify it, we take it without your permission and we sell it to someone who then has it forever. That does not happen. You actually have to opt in to be able to have your data used. You have to have basically for the data to go offshore, it can only go offshore to places that have equal levels of protection. 
those may not be the right way to do it in the US. I'm not even saying they are, but having the policy space, not have it taken away through a digital trade agreement is, um, is the way to go. So just um, to summarize, these are two sides of the same coin. These are both the problem that everyone saw in TPP where something called a trade agreement really has very little to do with trade, but rather is a corporate Trojan horse to try and consolidate power, limit regulation, carve out special rights and protections and do it in a framing, in a messaging platform that makes it not clear what's being done to us and makes it seem like it's a, a distant trade thing. It's about the tariffs on my footy pajamas. I shouldn't think about that. When in fact, it's these things are directly having to do with whether or not those old sneak attack rules on intellectual property for the pharmaceutical companies, whether we can make enough vaccines to end the COVID crisis. Three minutes. And in this instance, with the new proposed rules, whether we're gonna see big tech basically get a get out of jail free card before we can even actually start to regulate them. And I'll actually stop there. Again, the one last thing is the first action with respect to the digital trade is gonna be a big sign on letter. It's to educate, it's gonna to go to Congress. It's gonna to go to the White House. It's basically calling on the administration not to sign these agreements. The great news is, and very different from past fights, the trade representative's office is on our side on this. They recognize it's against the president's worker oriented trade agenda to do this. The State Department and the National Security uh, Council are now pushing it. And if you get a subscription to the Wall Street Journal, you can see a story about the knockdown drag out fight those two sides had over whether we should sign on to the TPP version of a digital trade agreement, which of course is also like the camel's nose under the tent to get the whole TPP back in its feet again too. So it's, it's, it's not just bad digital rules. It's also like a way to slide ourselves back into the disaster that is TPP. So with that, I am happy to take more questions. Thank take you questions. so much. Thank you, Lori. As always, fascinating, very disturbing. Uh, well, let's start with the, the questions on the COVID part of this. Lori uh, Dodd on our steering committee should have been monitoring the chat for those kind yes. of questions. Lori, would you, do you have any for us on that? I do. And first, I'm going to start with a question that actually uh, discusses both topics in a way, because it seems strange to me that EU and Germany are good in terms of protecting your privacy for data and restricting data flow. And yet at the same time, it is the EU and Germany that is blocking the waiver of the TRIPS um, protections. And so can, does that seem like a contradiction to you? Help me understand that. Um, in a way, yes, but not directly. So. Yeah. What a lot of people in the US don't know is that what we call the Pfizer vaccine is actually a German vaccine. So Pfizer got a license to manufacture and sell worldwide, except for China, Germany, and Turkey. A vaccine that's created, patented, copyrighted, et cetera, by, and, and by the way, for the mRNA vaccines, it's all the forms of IP. That's why the waiver covers all of them. So it's not just patents, like you right. give a small molecule drug. The computer programs that run the machines that have industrial design exclusivities have copyrights on the computer programs. And the data, that's the test data, has a data exclusivity. And there's a trade secrets over the, yeah. the know-how of how you do it, not just the actual recipe. Mm -hmm. So Germany's company called BioNTech actually is the developer of it. And they sold a license to Pfizer. So this is this mRNA platform is something that really has gotten no money from the usual corporate pharma funding because all the big companies like Pfizer never thought it was going to make any money. It's all government funded. So Germany and the EU funded BioNTech. The US government funded the company called Moderna, which equally quickly got and had been doing the mRNA research also for a decade, just like the German firm. Government funded, working actually with NIH. The National Institutes of Health in the US actually own some of the patents on the Moderna vaccine. And so that, that research um, is something that Germany is very proud of. And I think 
The reason if I've asked our German partners, I'm on their weekly coalition call as mm -hmm. one of the only Americans who speaks German, <laughs> that um, I think their theory of the case is the current government in Germany is the very conservative, it's like the Republicans, the Christian Democrats, they're very business friendly. And the theory of the case is that the mRNA research that was being done in Germany wasn't actually for vaccines for coronaviruses. It was for cancer cures, for malaria, for other things. So the theory of the case is that Germany, that the conservative party in Germany is against the waiver because they see a sort of mercantile interest of Germany going forward, having this like corner on this technology right. and being sort of the powerhouse selling it to the rest of the world. With respect to the data stuff, the European Union, which you know they take positions together, Germany has the ability to veto the other positions because they're the biggest economy and that's what they've done for this waiver, even though there's a split. In Europe, pretty broadly, there is a broad consumer bottom-up support for privacy. And by the way, mm -hmm. for better food safety and labeling rules and for being against GMOs. And even when a conservative government like in Germany would be happy probably to get rid of some of those policies, they would basically, you know, the consumers in Germany, whether they are conservative voters or left voters would like chase them around steak knives or something if they basically waive the ban on artificial hormones or GMOs. So in this instance, what's partially happening is a lack of information. And part of the work we've been doing at the coalition partners in Germany is to get a debate going. So Joe Stiglitz, the US economist, who's very well known and beloved in Germany, has actually been appearing on German television, German radio, has gotten op ed place to try and create the debate. Because they're leading up to their big national election to replace Angela Merkel, their leader of 16 years, and none of the left parties are willing to stick their heads up on this because it's seen as being against German commercial interests. So that is the story on that. Thank you. So the next question I've got comes from Rochelle Asher. Don't you think there has to be a massive emphasis on aid for vaccine production in poor countries? Isn't a waiver without that aid non-threatening to big pharma? So um, yes, first of all, yes, there needs to be aid and there needs to be manufacturing money that comes not just from the US, but from Europe, et cetera, to be able to stand up these new facilities that need to be created that can make mRNA vaccines, not just for COVID, though certainly for COVID, but as well for whatever is the next pandemic, because we just need a, we need a broader volume. And with COVID, Let's just say we know, which we don't yet, that once you've had the shot, you'll need a booster re for real, not just pharma trying to do it now before most right. people said any shot, but like for real, you'll need one in four years, say. Then we need that production of the 15 billion doses to be something that's sustainable without taking away from existing. So yes, absolutely, Rochelle, more money needs to come. And for mRNA production, interestingly, given it's so cutting edge, here's the shocker. It's e actually easier to stand up than traditional manufacturing because it's all inert chemicals. So like the J&J &J vaccine or the AstraZeneca, that's a thing called a denovirus platform where you actually like in a huge multi-story vat, you brew using another kind of virus, um, a basically a version of this other kind of virus that has some of the characteristics, basically a killed version of, but not quite <laughs> a modified version of, the um, COVID virus, and then you get a shot of that. But you, you need these ginormous industrial vats, and it takes you know weeks to brew enough mm -hmm. of the modified virus, which you then put into doses. Unlike mRNA, which is all actually inner chemistry. I mean, there, there's, there are a lot of steps to it, but it's, it's not a live cell line. You don't have to reproduce yeah. cell lines. One so minute. You don't, need, you don't <laughs> need the vats. You can step it up much more quickly. And about $25 billion could probably get around the world enough facilities, 11 of them stood up new ones to create another 9 billion doses. And there's math sort of showing all of that. I'm now, sorry, you said $25 billion? Yep, Thank 11 you. facilities and that could get between eight and nine more billion doses. Now, part of the thing Rochelle though is, and the reason pharma is fighting this tooth and nail and they're not fighting the more money because there's a bill on the more money is the way they see it is 
as long as the IP isn't waived, the only place that money can right. go is to them. That's right. They're going to have to be paid to maybe make more factories. So great, the government's going to pay for more factories for them to be paid to make more doses. So they're not worried if the money's there, but the waiver isn't. There is, just for you to know, about 2 billion doses worth right now of unutilized capacity. Because for all the sort of racist neo-colonialist bullshit that is going around, a lot of it in Germany of those countries can't make these fancy new vaccines, that is just crap. I mean, to start with, there was just an agreement for South Africa to make doses for Pfizer. So just to start with that. But, and this makes me, it's so racist and dismissive. The scientists who created the mRNA are like the UN of science. Right. So they may all be sitting in a lab in Germany, but every language in the world is spoken there. Yes. In China already, there are mRNA scientists making their own mRNA vaccines. So this very like racist, there's just no other word yeah. notion yeah. that those people can't make it is wrong. And in fact, there is a set of very high tech, world class pharmaceutical manufacturing laboratories around the world left over from the US last put billions in through uh. b- what's called BARDA during the early 2000s when there was going to be another flu pandemic. And so there is like, there's a thing called Invecta in Bangladesh, one of the leftovers of that. There's a, there's a thing called GETS in Pakistan. These are the names of the Institut Pasteur in Senegal. Around the world are these world-class producers. I mean, even some private ones that the US didn't fund, Tiva in Israel, they're just begging, hey, we can make mRNA. Any clean facility, a, a chip manufacturing plant, a, a computer chip manufacturing right. plant, has to be like the negative seals, the ventilation, the guys in the white suits, but you can quickly set up a line. The former chief chemist in Moderna said you could do it in three to four months if you have tech transfer and the IP. Okay, I've got a question by Nathan Goodman that seems a little related to what you've just been saying. He says, I've seen critics of IP waivers argue that even if the waiver is granted, the real binding constraint is a technological constraint on production. How do you respond to that? And given the difficulties of manufacturing vaccines, how many vaccines do you expect would be made if we allow others to try making the vaccine? So all of these questions are related. Let me just yes. also offer some very good resources at tradewatch.org, our website. Tradewatch. You go, tradewatch.org, www.tradewatch.org. If you go to the COVID page, which is the first thing you see, you'll mm-hmm. see a lot of fact sheets. And the fact sheets there yes. will have the same content I'm expressing okay. verbally, but we have everything linked up the wazoo. So you can go back to the original scientific articles to see I'm not making this stuff up. And also if you're a science wonk or a legal wonk or (laughs) a doctor, you actually can probably understand parts of it that good old lawyer me can't. So read away. And it's, you know, it's to the medical journals, it's to nature, it's to the, you know, really reliable sources. So the answer, Nathan, is that if there is just the IP waiver, then each of the companies that can have the ability, say, to in the clean facility actually make the mRNA vaccine, they will have to create the know-how of how to make it. So the regulatory filings that would be liberated if there's an IP waiver, the thing that you need to give to get the patent, to get the trademark, to, I mean, sorry, not the trademark, the the trade secret, to get the industrial design, you would have those things become publicly available to the teams of scientists and researchers and doctors at these facilities and at local universities. What it wouldn't say is, for instance, here are all the, here are all the pieces of it, but you know, like if you look at a recipe, there's always a thing at the bottom. You need one quarter teaspoon of this and six cups of that and two mm-hmm. of those. And what it doesn't say though in that list, which is what you would get from the regulatory filing is, first melt the butter and put aside half of the blah, blah, stir it in. Once you've Mm -hmm. cooled it down, stand in one foot, blow on it three times, put that aside, scramble the egg. Like it's that kind of stuff that you don't get. And that's called technology transfer. And that's the know-how. So if there is just the IP, then the scientists have to basically reverse engineer how to do it. So the good news is when Pfizer and Moderna first had to make the first doses last year to be able to be in the trials, no one had ever made these. So it took them, depending which company, between four and seven months from scratch to figure it out. 
So if you only get the list of ingredients, it could be a lag of four to seven months. It could right. take longer too, because you're going to have to do the same damn thing. Mm -hmm. If you also get the technology transfer, transfer, then you maybe do it like the Moderna chemist said in three to four months and boom, you have stuff going up. Right. What certainly is the case is these two big arguments of they can't do it over there. That's clearly wrong. But the other two big arguments are there aren't enough of the inputs. Well, as, as Joe Stiglitz famously said, in a market economy, once you get the IP barriers out of the way, the market solves for the there aren't <laughs> enough inputs because there is money to be made. If you need more glass vials, people will make more glass vials. One of the things that's a currently right now like a chokehold is a thing called a lipid. And it's part of the, the inputs for the mRNA vaccines. Well, if you do digging into it, there's a Nature magazine article about this. It turns out it's in the middle of a huge patent fight. And so one company claims to have the monopoly over making those lipids. So if you waive that monopoly in the supply uh -huh. chain, the market and the joys of capitalism would have a lot more people making all the inputs. Perfect. So that's, that's a baloney argument. And then the second one that's a baloney argument is you can't make the companies do a tech transfer. Well, actually, under the Defense Production Act, at least Moderna mm -hmm. could be made to do a tech transfer and right. maybe Pfizer too, because there are provisions in the Defense Production Act. Now, you got to deal with the IP issue. That's a separate issue. It's getting the actual legal monopoly lifted. Right. But as far as getting the, the tech transfer, there's language in the Defense Production Act where the government has the right in case of an emergency and and national, for national defense to allocate, and there's a whole list of stuff, and it's goods, supplies, resources and materials. And then the definition of materials is essential information necessary for the manufacture, distribution, or use of goods. Uh -huh. Well, the vaccines are a good, and obviously the know-how is a material. So if the Biden administration wanted to exercise its full rights and get us the darn trips waiver and then use the Defense Production Act, yeah. we could yeah. have the tax transfer and we could have the doses done in a time that can make a difference, Nathan. Great. Great. Lori, let me interrupt a minute and see, Carl, have you found any questions in the chat related to the global trade pack sneak attack? Uh, yes, yes, I have. All right, so let me just look at this. First of all, let me just thank you for doing this presentation, Lori. Yes. I mean, this has been extremely informative. Um, so yes, so I found a question from Al and he says, um, is there a draft of the WTO e-commerce agreement more recent than August of 2020? So my friend Mata Hari, no, I'm kidding. That someone's trying to liberate a new copy right now, but the sad <laughs> answer is no, there is no more recent wow. draft. But here, ladies and gentlemen, is the thing to know. And Carl, thank you very much for that kind introduction. I'm glad it's helpful. My like full-time joy is to actually translate absurd trade language into something approximating accessible English. So the, the, for literally four years, as this sort of process around the WTO is being negotiated, a variety of us were running around on one foot. Well, this is now the fourth year, so August 2020. For two and a half years before that damn thing leaked, Leak, we were saying mm. something very bad is being negotiated there. They don't have authority to do it. It's not an official WTO thing. It's like they sort of have it going on on the side. So you can't even track what they're doing. It's not all the countries. It's got to be bad. Get your hands on it. And everyone, every, a lot of people were saying, you know, those people are probably really paranoid and don't look over there. Squirrel, there must be something <laughs> else you care about. So finally, when that damn text leaked, it was like mana from heaven because suddenly it's like, hello. So probably, Carl, it's worse. And the person who asked um, Encore, the text is probably, was it Encore who asked? No, uh, Al. Al, uh, can I can't. Al, sorry. There's probably worse. It's probably more fleshed out. The way to understand, by the way, what that text is, is the square brackets are language that's contested. So if there's no square bracket around it, or it's like a regular round parentheses thing, or round parentheticals, like basically like a commentary on the text, the square brackets is what you want to look at. And that's where you can see what the fights are. And if the text weren't scrubbed, unfortunately it's scrubbed, you would have little country initials that would tell oh. you which country is on what side. So the fact that that leaked at all is a miracle, but someone scrubbed it. So we can't tell, I mean, I can tell, I'm pretty clear who's on what because I spend time trolling around Geneva. 
but it's not it, to read it. The thing to look for is the stuff that's not confirmed. And like what we know just from snooping is that some of the issues that are in square brackets there start to get resolved. The really big ones though, like on the liability waiver issue, on the data flows, on the trade secrets discrimination stuff, those are still being contested. And we need to keep them that way because at any point that, that gets settled, we are toast. It is already agreed in this, there are two sort of TPP proximate versions of this. One of them is literally in the thing that is sort of the TPP that other countries signed. And then there's a thing called DEPA. So if you hear of the DEPA, just think digital trade sneak attack. That is called the Digital Economy Partnership Agreement. In trade, if you hear the word partnership, hold on to your wallet. Yes. You know you're going to get screwed. So the, the, the DEPA is basically just the TPP stuff plus a little NAFTA stuff, which is even worse than TPP. And that is another thing that the US is thinking of doing as well as some like weird, we're gonna do TPP, just the digital stuff. So we need to watch both of those as scary things, but the only one we have that's leaked, that's the WTO is from August, 2020. But Al, if you wanna see the whole enchilada, so to speak, pull up, do Google for USMCA tax, Go to chapter, I'm going to get it wrong. I think it might be chapter 13. It's just look for the chapter that's digital trade and you will see all the stuff I'm talking about where it's a ban, any limits on movement of data, a requirement that every signatory country provide a waiver of liability, yeah. et cetera. That's the, that is, and the, that is even worse than the TPP. You can look at it. You can also Google for the digital trade text of a thing called the cynicism warning. This, the Comprehensive Progressive Trans-Pacific <laughs> Partnership, which is literally what New Zealand named the TPP um, with about like three commas change. So, you know, be sure to bring out like your barf bucket because anyone who worked on TPP is going to recognize the entire agreement when you open yeah. it and get like an anxiety flashback. But look at the digital trade chapter and you can see what we're in for. Okay, Carl or Lori, do you have any more questions we haven't gotten from the chat before we let Lori move on? I have one. Okay. Um, We're losing you, Lori. I think you muted. There am you I unmuted now? Yes, you are. Okay. I'm sorry. I love what you had to say about how in Germany, you have got the bottom-up support of the, the consumers who are saying safeguard our data uh, and protected from data flow everywhere that supports the biz biz businesses. And it seems like not only do we need a movement like that in the United States, but we also need a movement that says, uh, let's end the protections of big pharma and handle intellectual property in a way that serves the customers so that international science can work as a team to solve international problems. And I know that's, I, you know, I guess I'm asking you, what can you encourage us to do to get that kind of bottom up movement? I know that's what you devote your work to. So I think the most powerful thing that activists can do on both of these issues is make people aware mm -hmm. that this is happening and then direct people to the actions that seem most strategic. So in the short term, this petition that will go live in the next week or so is probably the best way for people to realize that although Biden did a great thing in May, they've totally dropped the ball since. Yes. There is no waiver and we're gonna have wave after wave of these dangerous variants until the rest of the world gets vaccinated. There is no way out for us. It's not just a slogan that no one is safe until everyone is safe. Right. It's sort of an empirical scientific fact. And that means we need to get the IP liberated and get the damn vaccines made at a volume that can actually get people shots in the arms. So, and with respect to the sneak attack of the digital agreements, the, the sign on letter is gonna be super helpful. And we're gonna be putting together actually now a campaign about awakening people. There'll be training modules and okay. webinar opportunities Great. And basically, some groups have already started to really realize, like, for instance, another really great, powerful document that I suggest folks look at, which you can find on our website, but go to the original source, is there's a group called the American Economic Liberties Project, intentionally kind of conservative sounding brand, it's progressives, and it is a project that was done with color of change, 
and the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. And it digs into how these digital trade agreement rules would undermine civil rights enforcement, would undermine rules against hate speech yeah. and racial incitement and how the basically promoting this liability waiver would mean that these platforms have no responsibility when like the Ku Klux Klan is organizing a, you know, beat up people of color activity. Okay. I'm delighted we have a recording of all of this because not only can we share it with other people who were not able to attend tonight, but you've provided such a wealth of information. You've outstripped my ability to take notes, so I can go back and. and uh, Lori Waller, so, uh, Lori, that we have so many, we have a lot of Lori's on tonight. If yes. we have time uh, from Carl or Lori to, to uh, for you to answer one more question, is there anything we've missed from the chat? Anybody that hasn't been addressed yet? I'm seeing um, can. What is the name of this new trade policy again? A question from Ankur Bhaskar. Yeah, so it comes, it, it's um, basically think rabid skunk, but named like black and white kitty and strange <laughs> stripe thing that has a tail that's bushy. So it comes in different versions. Sometimes it's called digital trade a digital trade agreement. Sometimes it's called a e-commerce trade agreement. Mm -hmm. Some of the formal names for it are the Digital Economic Partnership Agreement, DEPA, is one proper name. So, you know, if skunk is the category, then Pepe Le Pew, a Pepe Le Pew <laughs> version of it, is DEPA. It is one version of a digital agreement. Another version, this is so obscure, no one's ever going to hear this again, but just in case you hear it again. The Joint Statement Initiative on E-Commerce at the WTO, which you will hear is the JSI WTO EC. <laughs> that is another version of the proper name of one of these agreements. And then if you look at the Wall Street Journal argument, they just sort of go to shorthand and call it the digital rules of the TPP. Right. So part of the issue here is to brand it as a digital trade agreement, but they give it really fishy sounding names. Yes. So that you don't realize what it is. Thank you, uh, Lori Wallach, I, for participating in this meeting and educating us or trying to. Very complex subjects, but as you are uh, reputed to be, you explain them very well for people who aren't experts. And uh, I look forward to staying in touch with you and you will keep me informed of what actions we can take specifically and giving us the tools and the papers and we will take them. We will make sure. So thank, thank you. Folks tradewatch.org because I know I went fast and it's a ton of information and all those materials are useful. And we also put all the best stuff from Doctors Without Borders and Partners in Health and all the group letters on the, on the pharma thing. And then on the digital stuff, if you just want it, you can search digital trade TPP because we do have a fact sheet or digital trade USMCA. We tried to get the word out on this. No one thought it was real. Now that the tax leak, people believe us. <laughs> so you can get a sense of what it is that we are up to. And then again, the letter with color of change in the American Economic Liberties Project lays it out. And um, I just wanna thank everyone from, for listening through all of this. The reality of it's really simple. I've given you, cause you're all activists and wants the background. So you are feeling strong about explaining it with no doubts. The bottom line is the corporate power grab using trade agreements to yeah. you know, put money over people's lives and stopping the pandemic in one instance, and to put basically a monopoly and control over our lives through data control worldwide and monopoly through big tech. It's really simple at a high level. I just wanted everyone to know the details so that when you're wrangling with your Congress critters who may or may not be with the program, <laughs> you are armed up and feeling super duper comfortable and competent because it is a thicket in the details, but at the high level, really clearly simple, a power grab and something we can all do together. And, and I want to apologize. I was going to stay on to be able to hear because I want to hear what Gar Gareth has to say. But that personage, um, Sandra, who has who had texted me before, has yeah. texted me three more times and I better call her back. So I might be back. But for the moment, I'm going to just pop off the camera. Thank you so and much, Lori. This has been phenomenal. And at the high level, you're right. For a bunch of Bernie progressives, it's not surprising at the high level. But thank you for giving us tools to take action. Very thank much appreciate it. We hope to see you I back a little back. later. I mean okay. Thanks, Lori. Fantastic. Uh,
Well, let's move on to our next topic now. I want to introduce our next speaker, uh, Joe Loria. Joe Loria is Editor-in-Chief of Consortium News. It was founded in 1995 by the late investigative journalist Robert Perry, who broke major Iran-Contra stories for the Associated Press and Newsweek. Joe is a 30-year veteran correspondent on international affairs, reporting for the Boston Globe, the Montreal Gazette, and the, the Johannesburg Star, uh, the Wall Street Journal, and numerous other papers. He was an investigative reporter for the Sunday Times of London, has won two journalism awards, and uh, anchored two books, one with the late Senator Mike Gavel. Uh, so, uh, Joe? Please update us on Julian Assange. And audience, please write your questions for Joe in the chat while he's speaking. Go ahead, Joe. Thank you very much, Sandra, and your organization for inviting me here. Uh, that's right, Bob Perry started this in 1995. It could very well be the first independent online news magazine. Bob created it because Newsweek and AP were spiking his stories on Iran-Contra. And then he went to Newsweek uh, after AP, and they did the same, so he got fed up and started a consortium of journalists in the mainstream who had the same things happening to them. This happened to me at the Wall Street Journal, some of the other papers as well, but particularly the journal were spiking stories uh, about Palestine and other issues. I was covering the United Nations for them, so foreign news. Uh, and I started slipping stories to Bob back in 2010 or 12, I can't remember now. And he was publishing them. And unfortunately, Bob passed away in 2018. I became the editor. So I'm going to go quickly through some of the false things that people believe about Julian Assange, persistently believe these things. And they can easily be uh, debunked. And I'm going to do that right now very quickly. I have a little bit of time, so I'm going to do mostly bulletin points. And I'll take questions after that. There is a link to the previous speaker, because it was WikiLeaks that published excerpts from the TPP. It had been secret. Trade agreement, as everybody knows, that's what WikiLeaks does. They get material sent by sources, whistleblowers. To them, they verify that it's true, and they publish it. That means that the first myth about Assange is that he's a whistleblower. He's not a whistleblower. He's a publisher. His sources are the whistleblowers. They publish the material. So it began in December 2006. The first documents were... Uh, about corruption in Kenya and the U.S. Army Manual for Guantanamo. And uh, that this within 15 months of those two documents, with the establishment of WikiLeaks, there was a document written by the Cyber Counterintelligence Assessment Branch at the Pentagon. It's a 32-page document, and it describes in details destroying the, quote, free feeling of trust that is WikiLeaks' center of gravity. It says that this quote would be achieved with threats of exposure and criminal prosecution and an unrelenting assault on reputation. That means against Assange and others who worked with him at WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks. So by March 2008, there was already a US government plan to destroy the reputation of Julian Assange. Now, there are these five myths about him that I'm gonna to try to tell you are false. One, the idea is out there, it's firmly entrenched, including in the mainstream media, that Assange is not a journalist. Now, of course, his methods are 21st century methods. He is publishing raw material documents. Uh, but the New York Times used to do things like that, too. I'm old enough to remember there would be four or five pages in this big broad sheet of uh, important documents, for example, the Pentagon Papers. There were huge excerpts, several pages in small print that you could actually read the documents when anybody like the State of Union address would be published, the entire text. Now but you go online, newspapers put this stuff online. So there is something, uh, a tradition of publishing raw material. This is what Julian Assange does, but he's not just a clerk receiving materials and then putting them out. They are not only verifying them, but they're reading them. And Assange has certainly spoken widely and written widely about the issues that these documents uh, reveal. And that makes him, in my view, very much a journalist of, as I said, uh, a 21st century type. And that gives a lot of uh, mainstream journalists reason to call him not a journalist. There could be some professional jealousy there, too, in terms of the number of, of uh, scoops that WikiLeaks has had. Now, there's a very important reason legally why 
he's portrayed as not a journalist. So we can go back to December 2010, when then Vice President Joe Biden, he told Meet the Press, quote, if he, Assange, conspired to get these classified documents with a member of the U.S. military, that's fundamentally different than if someone drops on your lap. Uh, and then he reached over to David Gregory, who was in, uh, interviewing on, on Meet the Press, and he said, uh, uh, Biden said, here, David, you're a press person, here is classified material. In other words, Biden was making a clear distinction between a journalist who receives stolen U.S. property, classified documents, defense information, and publishes them, which Biden was implying then he was protected by the First Amendment to do, and a journalist who goes in with someone to steal these documents, either from a cabinet locked like the Pentagon Papers were in those days, or now hacked that material out of government computers. So uh, Biden made clear that was what they needed to get to, in, in order to prosecute Assange. Well, guess what? They never prosecuted Assange, Joe Biden. They started the Obama-Biden administration. They had to prove he stole the government's documents, and they were unable to do that. And the reason that was given that they did not prosecute him under the Espionage Act was because what he'd done, the New York Times and other big media had done exactly the same, even with the same documents. The 2010 releases about Afghanistan, Iraq, and Guantanamo, which is the basis of the Trump administration uh, prosecution, which eventually came, were the same ones published by The Guardian in Britain and El Pais in Spain and Der Spiegel in Germany and The New York Times in the United States. So if you're going to, logically, if you're going to prosecute Assange for publishing leaked classified material, which he did not steal himself, then you'd have to prosecute the New York Times. And of course, they did not do that. So they did never indicted Assange. Now, this became uh, an issue at the very beginning of Assange's extradition hearing, when he was pulled out of the embassy of Ecuador and arrested in April. And there's another reason I think the Biden, sorry, the Obama administration did not indict Assange. And that is because uh, indictments, and there was one, it was sealed back then in 2010, an Espionage Act one. Um, but they didn't get him on the compute, computer. They didn't get enough evidence to get him that he had hacked material or a conspiracy to commit computer intrusion. So because there was no arrest, I mean, he was being protected by the Ecuadorian government inside the Ecuadorian embassy. That government was not giving up Assange. So they normally, a, a Department of Justice does not reveal an indictment until the arrest is made for fear that the suspect may flee if they know he's about to be indicted. Of course, in Assange's case, that's absolutely ridiculous because they knew where he was in the embassy of Ecuador and he was not, not leaving there because the British made it clear they would arrest him the moment, the moment he stepped foot outside the embassy for a, a skipped bail, a very minor charge, but that would have been the, the way to get Assange. So he never left the embassy and the government of, uh, of Obama could not indict or release the indictment because they couldn't get him arrested. That did change when the new Ecuadorian government came. They were more friendly to the US interests and they allowed the British police into the embassy, which they have to do to arrest Assange. It was that point the indictments were revealed. Um, in the opening then, as he was imprisoned in Belmarsh, the extradition hearing began in February, 2020. I was in London, I got inside the courtroom for one day of that uh, first week of hearings, first four days of hearings. And on the very first day, the prosecutor for the United States, James Lewis, a Queens counselor, turned to the press box at the very beginning. The, and he addressed the reporters in the courtroom and said, this case by the US is not against you. It's not against the press. It's against this guy, Assange, who he's gonna try to portray as a hacker, not as a journalist. He's not a journalist. But after several weeks, then as the resumption of the extradition hearing began, started again in September of 2020, had been interrupted by the pandemic, they changed tack because many defense witnesses took the stand and made it pretty clear, they made a very strong case, that indeed Julian Assange was acting as a journalist, engaging in journalistic activity, whether you call him a journalist or not, the activity that was in the indictment that was revealed was, very, was journalistic activity. It says that he was trying to protect his source, Chelsea Manning, and he was trying to get more information out of her. This somehow was seen as a criminal act by the Trump administration. When our founder, Bob Perry, wrote it's way back in 2010, when those first documents came out, when the 
Obama administration was trying to decide whether to indict or not, that that's what he did in his major scoops on Iran-Contra and other stories as an invest, one of the best investigative reporters of his time was to uh, encourage his sources to even break the law, small law, to help prevent a larger war like war crimes, for example, from being committed. So after hearing all this evidence, the US uh, prosecution changed its course and actually said towards the end that, yeah, OK, he's a journalist, but the Espionage Act makes no exemption for journalists. And unfortunately, this is true. It simply says anyone who has unauthorized possession and then unauthorized dissemination of defense information can be prosecuted for espionage under the Espionage Act. Now, Franklin Roosevelt, Richard, uh, in ninth, during the war, tried to indict Chicago Tribune reporters for uh, revealing information about the Midway attack. It, it didn't, the, the grand jury refused to return the indictment. Richard Nixon tried to indict reporters from the New York Times during the Pentagon Papers. He impaled a grand jury in Boston. That also collapsed when the Ellsberg case collapsed. So Obama tried, as, again, as I described, and he decided not to indict because they couldn't prove that he'd stolen the documents. He'd only acted as a journalist. So that First Amendment is a conflict with the Espionage Act as it's now written. It's unresolved. But technically, you can arrest a journalist the way the Espionage Act is written. And that's exactly what the Trump administration decided to do. Now, the other reasons I'm saying that Assange is a journalist, because he's won 40, 30 or 40 journalism awards, one from The Economist magazine, and he won a Walkley Award, which is Australia's Pulitzer Prize. And he was beloved and, and uh, feted in the 2010 time when he published these documents about Afghanistan and Iraq that showed prima facie evidence of US war crimes in Iraq, one of the most famous being the helicopter video from a cockpit that showed the shooting of civilians on the ground in a Baghdad street, including journalists from Reuters. But there were other things and Afghanistan showed that there had been a massacre of families, uh, of a family in a house by US troops and they bombed that house to try to destroy evidence, as well as death squads the US was running in Afghanistan. These are the kinds of things that WikiLeaks reveal, which is why the US government is so intent on getting him because he's embarrassing them by revealing what appears to be prima facie evidence of war crimes and there's corruption as well. And many governments have been exposed by WikiLeaks, including Russia and Israel and many countries around the world. So he's a hated figure by governments, but he has revealed information the public needs to know. Number, the next myth is that he's a rapist. Assange was charged with rape. That's what you hear over and over again, even by, uh, supporters of Julian Assange, and it is false. There were never any charges in Sweden leveled against Assange for rape. He was wanted for questioning. And the fact is, two women went to the police to say they wanted him to get an STD test because he had had unprotected sex with them. And this was turned, as we know from Nils Meltzer, the UN uh, Rapporteur on Torture, who knows Swedish and read the Swedish police documents, that the, they, were document, they were doctored by the police to turn into an allegation of rape, which was never made by these women. And then that was leaked to the Swedish press. And then it went around the world that he was charged with rape. He was even accused of rape was not true, but certainly he was not charged with rape. And we know from Stefania Marizzi, an Italian journalist from La Repubblica, in those days she obtained documents through a FOIA that the British government was pressuring Sweden not to come to London to interview Assange in his uh, room at the embassy. They said, don't get cold feet, don't come here. They wanted him to stay in that embassy as long as possible until they could get their hands on him, which they eventually did in April 2019 with the change of the government. So um, Meltz's uh, important uh, revelations about those rape allegations uh, uh, need to be understood because there was no rape charge and it's been dropped three times. And the first time, a few days after the initial um, uh, uh, interview that the women gave to the police, it was dropped. There was no basis of any kind of rape, the prosecutor at the time said, but twice more they tried to question him on this. He went into the Ecuadorian embassy because he lost his extradition case against Sweden because the Swedes were not, Britain told him, don't come here, get him extradited to Sweden. And his lawyers believed, as it turned out correctly, that Sweden would turn him then on to the US in an extradition on these serious charges of espionage. The other myth is that Trump was elected because of Julian Assange, that Assange helped Trump get elected. Julian Assange is nonpartisan. He said the choice between Clinton and Trump was between gonorrhea and uh, cancer. So very much like 
Consortium News and Bob Perry, we are totally nonpartisan, meaning we criticize both major parties all the time. That's the way Assange is. He was not trying to help Donald Trump. That's a mistaken understanding because, for one thing, in the film uh, by Laura Poitras called Risk, you see him, uh, Assange, this was back in 2016. He's on the phone in the film speaking to someone, and he says, we've just obtained emails on Hillary Clinton, and we hope to get something on Trump. As Stefania Marie to show, she worked in the embassy with Assange on the Podesta emails. They did get some Trump documents. They found out they'd already been published. So the, he was trying to get stuff on Trump, too. And he wasn't unable to. So you don't, do you withhold information about one of the candidates because you can't get stuff on the other? And we know that the DNC and Podesta emails were accurate. There were resignations, including Debbie, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, of course, days after this revelation. Why would they resign if this stuff wasn't true? And the fact was that it, it doesn't matter who gave these emails to WikiLeaks because they're accurate. They're accurate information. WikiLeaks pioneered what's called an anonymous Dropbox so that even WikiLeaks doesn't know who gave them the material. They say Russia didn't give them to them, and I'm saying it doesn't matter. Maybe Russia did. doesn't matter because the material is accurate. We have informants in courtrooms giving evidence that, that convict people all the time, and they're, they're horrible people. They're criminals themselves, but if the evidence that they present in court is true, it could convict someone, and this doesn't, it doesn't matter who the source is. If the information is true, we're not talking about an oral interview with someone. We're talking about documents. If somebody gives you documents and they're accurate, you're going to publish them no matter who gave them to you. And it, as I said, the anonymous drop boxes, which are now used by CNN, The Guardian, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, they get stuff all the time that they don't know who the uh, source is. If they check, if it checks out, if it's newsworthy and accurate, they're going to publish it. That's what Assange did in this case. Um, even Robert Mueller was unable to charge Assange with any crime in this because he says, uh, Mueller argues that GRU, Russian agents, gave this to WikiLeaks, but he says Assange wouldn't have known who he was speaking to. So he did not indict or charge Assange at all in this case. In fact, what he's in prison for right now, waiting the US appeal, even though his, his extradition was denied, is only documents that he published in 2010, the same ones the New York Times published. Uh, so the 2016 election has nothing to do with his arrest. Then the, during the uh, extradition hearing, the endangered informants became a major charge of the U.S. saying that he had in, in, uh, revealed names of informants, when in fact we know from an Australian journalist, Mark Davis, who was in the bunker that was in The Guardian in London, working with the other newspapers, including The Times and Der Spiegel, uh, that they didn't care. Those The mainstream journals didn't care about the informants. Assange stayed up all night through a weekend redacting those names. He was the one who was concerned about that, according to Davis, who was present at the time. And in fact, it was only when the Guardian reporters themselves in a book published the password to the unredacted Afghan, uh, the, the, uh, the doc documents, the State Department cables, that Assange realized then informants would become known. So he then put it out online. The, the um, the online, uh, I'm forgetting its name right now, there's an online site that puts out documents all the time. They put it out before the WikiLeaks did and they were never, uh, they were never charged. Only Assange was charged for putting out these documents and only the Guardian had released the, the password that made it possible for intelligence services around the world to look up if any names were in there that were not uh, redacted, any informants. So. Even at the time of the leaks in 2010, Robert Gates, who was the defense secretary, said that no informants were harmed and that the releases only caused embarrassment. He said, quote, that the supposed harm was, was fairly significantly overwrought. So even Robert Gates was saying this is much ado about nothing, but it was those documents that he was talking about that formed the basis of the indictment and have Julian Assange right now in Belmarsh prison in a very dangerous circumstance. So I go back to the hacker issue. As I said, the Obama Department of Justice did not have the evidence that uh, he'd worked with Manning to steal those documents. Manning herself said in her court martial that she acted alone, and it was the Trump administration that indicted Assange. And I think it was driven by the Vault 7 releases about the CIA and Mike Pompeo when he became CIA director under Trump. First speech he gave was an attack on WikiLeaks, calling it a hostile state, a non-state intelligence agency. And even though he's not charged for that Vault 7 release, which was during the Trump 
administration. He didn't only reveal stuff during Obama, but during Trump, during the Bush administration. Uh, again, it's nonpartisan. The, this is why they went after um, Assange. They were able to get him to be evicted from the embassy because the government changed in Ecuador, as I said. And once he was uh, arrested, the indictments came out. The first indictment was the Espionage Act charge, which explains journalistic activity where he's trying to get Chelsea Manning to give him more information and to hide her identity, which is not a crime. It's what any investigative journalist has to do. Any journalist who's using an unnamed source has to do, protect their sources. They go to jail journalists for protecting their sources. So to make this a crime is extremely troubling. And right. they also, they also I'm getting to the end, they also unveiled the conspiracy, conspiracy for computer intrusion claiming that he worked, Assange did, with Manning to steal these documents. But it was such a weak uh, um, indictment that they came up with a superseding indictment of June of 2020, which quoted a key witness, an FBI informant who was a teenager at the time in Iceland, saying that he, that Assange had directed him to hack. That was their major key witness. And last month in an Icelandic publication called Stunden, this then teenager, as he's referred to in this superseding indictment, named Sigurdur Thordudson, recanted. He said everything he said in that indictment is a lie. So that has completely crumbled. So we go back to the espionage act. That's all that's left. The computer conspiracy charge has almost completely disappeared. The espionage act is in conflict with the First Amendment. But why is Assange still in jail? Because even though the judge on January 4th denied his extradition to the U.S. on health grounds, the you because he's suicidal if he goes to a U.S. supermax prison, the Biden administration continues to uh, pursue an appeal. And he was thrown back in Belmarsh, even though he was discharged because he was a flight risk, according to the judge. So he he rots in Belmarsh at the Biden administration, which goes out there, Blinken and Biden, saying that they defend free press, uh, showing what hypocrites they are because they are continuing this pursuit of Julian Assange, and it goes back on Biden's words of 2010, in which he says, if we can't get him on the computer charge of stealing the documents, we can't do anything against him. Well, the computer charge has crumbled, and all I've got left is Espionage Act, and Biden is not acting on the words that he spoke in 2010. Many people postulate it's because of the 2016, which this myth that Assange is the one who defeated Hillary Clinton, not her own bad camp bad campaigning, not uh, desperate people who believe the con man, uh, Donald Trump, not a myriad of other reasons, the FBI uh, uh, release of the information about her server in Westchester County. That was, no, that was Julian Assange did. Well, no, 2016 has nothing to do with his arrest, as I said. It's only the 20, 2010 documents. Biden spoke to that. He said, we can't get them because we don't have the computer information. They don't have it. And yet they're pursuing this. So I would say anybody who's any connections to Congress, particularly the Department of Justice, or anybody in the Biden administration who could speak to them about this, I urge them to do that. Wow. Joe, oh my Lord, that is uh, devastating to hear uh, these details. Um, I wish we had um, some kind of specific action who, um, well, that we could take and you, maybe we can get into this. I wanna ask uh, AC Powell it has been monitoring the chat and may have some questions for you now. Let's start with AC. Why don't you go ahead and start asking some questions of Joe? All right. Thank you, Joe, for that presentation. I've got a couple questions here in the chat for you. The first one comes from one of our own in Ornova, and it's, you were lucky to know Mike Gravel. Rest in peace to Mike Gravel. What was he like in person? <laughs> yeah, I knew Mike Gravel very, very well. I met him first in 2006, and I began to cover his campaign for presidents. He knew he was never going to win. He was going to, of course, uh, do this to try to promote his ideas of direct democracy. And I was able to go to the uh, debates. I sat in his wife's chair behind Michelle Obama, and ultimately was a book that I wrote with Mike called uh, Political Odyssey, The Rise of American Militarism, One Man's Fight Against It. And uh, so I spent many, many, many hours on the road with Mike uh, in my apartment in New York at the time, uh, interviewing him and working on the book together. And uh, look, he was a politician, and he admits in the book that he lied to get elected the first time to the Senate. He was actually against the war in Vietnam, but his opponent, uh, Gruning, who had been uh, a senator for a long time, sort of the father of the state of Alaska, was anti-Vietnam War. Uh, uh, Gravel took, said publicly that he was for the war in order to get elected, and it worked. 
And quickly after that, within his eight, his uh, two terms, 12 years in the Senate, he became one of the leading anti-war advocates. Of course, he was the one that accepted finally the Pentagon Papers from Dan Ellsberg and read them into the congressional record. So Mike also told me, and it's in the book, that he lied uh, to some people at the State House in Alaska. He was first a state legislator. And, uh, he promised committee, he was the uh, Speaker of the House, so he, he promised committee chairmanships to like five people and there was only one chairmanship and then afterward they accused him of lying to them and he said yes I like so on the tactics Mike was an actor like a politician but when it came to principle this was a guy I could not believe I when I first met him at the Waldorf Astoria for a breakfast I didn't realize I could not believe this guy had been an American politician and and a senator for two terms so Mike Ravel was a great man he had enormous principle and courage to read the Pentagon Papers he worked till the very end on issues that were important to him. And uh, he was on our board at Consortium News. He was a supporter of WikiLeaks and Julian Assange. And we're gonna miss Mike very well. I, I grew very, very close to him. And it was like losing a family member actually when he died just a few weeks ago. AC, I would love to jump in here and ask my own question. I'm gonna take a moderator's privilege. Sure. Um, it's the 50th anniversary. You mentioned the Pentagon Papers a couple of times. It's the 50th anniversary of the Supreme Court decision uh, protect to protect uh, uh, Daniel Ellsberg from uh, for his releasing of the Pentagon Papers. I'd like you to compare the current reality of legal protections for journalists, and then I'm going to throw in whistleblowers too, uh, making the distinction they're different, who reveal abuses of power. Now the legal protection to those that were in place when Seymour Hersh revealed the Vietnam My Lai slaughter and right. when Daniel Ellsberg released the Pentagon Papers. Where are we now compared to them in terms of legal protections? Yes, a very good question. Sandra, I wrote a piece on Consortium News uh, maybe two years ago now. I'm trying to remember exactly uh, what, what I did was compare the release of the uh, My Lai, uh, the My Lai in incident with the release of the collateral murder incident. In other words, the video by WikiLeaks that showed the killings on the street of Baghdad. Mm. And, in the, and, and it's 50 years apart, basically. What happened in Milai is that um, the journalist who broke the story wound up getting a Pulitzer Prize and got a full-time job at the New York Times. The whistleblower at the time went to Congress, was listened to, was not in any way harmed, and it led to an arrest of at least one US soldier for that, although many others were participating in that. So what happens? We have the journalist getting an award and a big job. We have the whistleblower being protected and listened to by Congress. And we have at least one perpetrator of the crime in Milai who was arrested. Fast forward 50 years to the WikiLeaks revelation, the whistleblower Chelsea Manning spent uh, seven years in jail before Obama co commuted her sentence. The journalist, didn't get an award and a, and a big job. He's right now in prison for his work as a journalist revealing these crimes. And the no one was arrested in that helicopter crew that killed those people in Baghdad. It's the, the, the source, the whistleblower, Chelsea Manning, who spent seven years in jail. And it's the journalist who, who reported it, who's now in jail. And the guys who committed those war crimes in that helicopter, and they, you could hear their voices, they're laughing, they're joking about killing people never have been harmed in any way. That tells you where we've come in 50 years in the United States. It's chilling, really chilling. Go ahead, AC. Adjust my camera, I apologize for that. All right, I have another or two part question from our own Lori Dodd. Uh, what is the Biden administration doing towards Assange now? And who is currently working to support Assange? Well, what the Biden administration is doing is going against the words of Joe Biden of 2010, because they don't really have this computer charge anymore. He's only under the Espionage Act. He has been, uh, the extradition request was denied on his mental health and the conditions of U.S. supermax prisons, the combination of which could lead to a very strong and very severe risk of suicide. That's what the judge said. So he was discharged, but he was put back in jail. At that point, the U.S. government it was still Trump administration. This was January, a few weeks before the inauguration, decided to uh, pursue an appeal. That appeal is still going on by the Biden administration. Now, what we know is that a couple of weeks ago, the high court in London had to make a decision whether to accept 
this application for appeal or not. And usually on health grounds, they wouldn't. But what the US did, we know now, uh, is the they put out an offer after the trial is over in the lower court or the hearing. So this is amounts to new evidence, which normally an appeals court does not accept. It has to be evidence presented at trial or at the lower court extradition hearing in this case. And that new evidence is the US says, okay, we won't put him in a supermax. However, unless he does something, and this is the actual language, if he does something, we could put him in. Never, <laughs> what is something? So right away, this is a very qualified offer not to put him in the supermax. And if he's convicted and he win and we win our appeals, he can go to Australia in a more humane prison rather than a US supermax, which could be 10 or more years if all the appeals uh, go through. So if he's still alive after all that time, we'll send him to Australia. And this is extraordinary that the high court accepted this offer and has approved the appeal application by the United States. So he remains in Belmarsh prison in, in very bad health, and nobody knows when this appeal will be heard. Some people say November, no date was set. And this started in January 4th. That's when the appeal, when the US said they would appeal the day they lost the extradition case. So why is the Biden administration and Anthony Blinken, who's making these grandiose statements about protecting free press, and uh, why are they pursuing this journalist? Because he was a huge embarrassment and danger to the ongoing activities of US intelligence, of the military, they don't want these secrets to be revealed. This is not the Milai time when a secret was revealed about a US atrocity and there was some action taken. This is today and that cannot be revealed and he's gonna be punished. So the Biden administration, Joe Biden himself, who said in 2010 that we really can't prosecute him if we don't have him on the computer charge. We now, as I explained, that computer charge has collapsed pretty much. They're still pursuing this guy. And I think these are the intelligence agencies that are pressuring Biden or Biden is just thinks this guy, uh, you know, endangered informants, which he did not do hurt national US national security. No, they he hurt the security of these guys' reputations, their careers, and their ability to continue to commit these kinds of crimes, basically. That's what he hurts. He opened up what the mainstream media rarely does anymore, real investigative reporting to hold power account. Assange did that, and they are still going after him. And I'm really very disappointed by that. Who supports Assange? He has a big network of people, obviously beyond his lawyers, they, uh, they march. They chant, they sign petitions, they, we have, uh, there, are, there are webcasts by many of them. We do our part by reporting in great detail uh, what his whole case has been about, both on our webcast, CN Live, and in the pages of Consortium News, whenever there's news about this or analysis. We just had one about the computer case. And I did a six part series on the history of the Espionage Act and how it affects Julian Assange and how it's how related it is to the Official Secrets Act in Britain. Uh, so we doing our journalism about this, which the mainstream press has done very little on, even though the day he was arrested, even Rachel Maddow, who couldn't, who said she couldn't stand Julian Assange said that this is wrong because it endangers all of journalism. The New York Times editorial board, the Washington Post, they all said disparaging things about Assange personally, but they all defended his right to do what he did, because they know that it comes back to them as journalists. This is an attack on journalism. Big media has understood that. They've kind of abandoned them again now. We need to hear more from big media. We need somebody to get to the Biden's mind, to remind him what he said in 2010, drop this case and take your chances that other people are going to reveal classified information that reveal bad things that Americans and other people around the world do. That's what journalism is supposed to do. If you can't hack that, then maybe that was the wrong word. Don't commit these crimes and corruption. But of course, that's endemic to governments all over the world. So they've got to let him go to do his work again, first to get healthy. Uh, we have two minutes before we wrap this up for one more question, AC. OK, so I have a question here. It says, please comment on the recent Pegasus report uh, revelations that military grade spyware leased by the Israeli firm NSO Group to governments for tracking terrorists and criminals was used in attempted and successful hacks of 37 smartphones belonging to journalists, human rights activists, business executives, and two women closest to murdered Saudi journalist Kamal Kusagi. 
this is part of the overall crisis that we're all going through in terms of the surveillance that is happening in this age of advanced computer technology. We know, of course, mostly from Ed Snowden that the National Security Agency uh, and the CIA, we know from the Vault 7 releases by WikiLeaks, scoop up everything, everything they can get their hands on. That was the mantra Tom Drake told me, the NSA whistleblower, collect everything. This was right after 9-11. So collect everything, and they are collecting everything, and they're storing these massive servers out in Utah. That doesn't mean they're spying on everybody in real time. Of course, that's impossible, and they don't need to do that. But they are collecting and storing. So if you become a person of interest, they can go and call you up, find out what you've said online, what you've said on the telephone, what emails you've written, what websites you've seen, everything they've collected. So the Pegasus project is, you know, has to be seen in that context. This is not a one-off terrible thing that was done. It's part of a, a government surveillance around the world. This was an Israeli program. Yes, they targeted journalists, but everybody, every journalist, every citizen has their data being collected. Now, apparently the other day, um, Merrick Golden, the attorney general, come up with new press guidelines that are supposedly better. But again, they're still going after Assange. The press guidelines are not to uh, collect this kind of material or use it against journalists to find out who their sources are. That's normally how they would try to use this surveillance material, to listen to their phone calls, to read their emails and see who the source was on a leak investigation. So we have a long way to go to stop governments from spying on journalists. This is just the latest case of that happening by this end. And it was interesting, Amnesty International first got these, this material. Um, Somebody, Moon of Alabama, I have no idea whether he's telling the truth or not. A blogger thinks that the National Security Agency leaked this stuff about Pegasus because he, they're a competitor to them. I don't know if that's true. So we don't really know why this got into the public domain right now. Uh, the Israeli companies are upset, obviously. They're denying all this, that uh, they were only giving it to governments to go after criminals and terrorists, not law-abiding citizens and journalists. But we, did, we now know that they did. Part of the overall surveillance uh, crisis that... We are going, we are still under, years after Snowden now, nothing's changed. It's as bad as it's ever been and probably getting worse because the technology keeps getting better. Joe, this Morning. has been enlightening, disturbing, very disturbing, but very enlightening. Thank you so much on giving us an update on the deplorable situation of Julian Assange and other commentary on the unending surveillance of all of us. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, let's move on to our next speaker. Our next speaker you, is, Sandra. is Gareth Porter. Gareth Porter is an independent investigative journalist and historian who has written articles and books on the national security state's lies and its aggressive imperialist behavior, both during the Cold War and since. He covered the Vietnam War as a journalist in Saigon in 1970 through 71 was co-director of the Indochina Resource Center, which had educated members of Congress on the wars in Indochina. And, six, and he succeeded, in, and the center succeeded in cutting military assistance to the Saigon government in 1974-75. He wrote the definitive book on the Paris Peace Agreement in 1975. He has been revealing the real stories behind the lies of the national security state about Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, Syria, and Yemen since 2003, and has published books on how and why the U.S. started the war in Vietnam and has pursued aggressive policies towards Iran. He's now working on a book on the Cold War as a deception. Over to you, Gareth. You need to un unmute, Gareth. There you go. That's it. Okay. Thanks so, thanks so much, Sandra. And congratulations on this uh, entire uh, meeting, which has produced such fantastic information from both of your previous speakers. Uh, I'm going to struggle to try to meet their standards uh, in the minutes that I have. Um, wh what I'm gonna be talking about is uh, the problem that I know all of your uh, listeners uh, and watchers tonight are very uh, well aware of, which is that the movement that seemed to be so powerful at the time of the US invasion of Iraq in 2003, um, and, and that uh, really showed promise of uh, duplicating what had happened 
uh, in the anti-war movement during the Vietnam War uh, somehow disappeared over the next several years uh, and that it really hasn't ever recovered. And we have, uh, as a result of this, we have seen, uh, we've experienced a situation uh, for the last um, 15 years or so, um, nearly 15 years, in which the, uh, the, the left uh, activists have been essentially moving on to other issues, uh, have not been focusing uh, very much at all on the militarism of the United States and its imperialistic uh, behavior abroad. Um, and, and this is a problem that uh, is really uh, one that, that affects everybody because it means that the power of the US military and of the Pentagon and the national security state uh, is very much uh, free from any effective opposition, any effective control. Clearly the Congress is not doing its part, has not done its part to control uh, the Pentagon and the military uh, over the last few decades. Um, and so uh, what I wanted to do here is to analyze uh, very quickly what, what uh, has happened and try to suggest a direction that I think that it would be very useful for activists to take uh, to try to, to begin to rebuild a more effective movement. Now, let me say at the outset, uh, I mean, I'm not suggesting that we are on uh, in any way, way, shape or form uh, uh, in a position to be, have a quick fix on this problem. On the contrary, this is a very long-term problem that we face. Um, it's not going to be solved in a year or two years or three years. Uh, it requires a lot of discipline in terms of intellectual effort and political effort uh, to, to, be, to, to construct a more effective approach to this problem. But I think I do have an idea here, which uh, I, I think is worthy of your consideration. Uh, so, so basically, I think the problem is that uh, the, the anti-war movement of the past has been limited to opposing a specific war, whether it was uh, Iraq or Afghanistan. And uh, to the extent that that war uh, is ending or has ended, the, uh, the movement is therefore weakened and uh, is unable to have the effect that it had hoped to have. Um, and I think that this problem is, is one that uh, has, it's, it's more or less recognized by people, but nobody knows what to do about it. So what I want to suggest is that uh, activists shift their focus, uh, or at least the focus in the past, from specific mm -hmm. wars or a specific war to the system. Now, I know everybody opposes the system in some sense. This is not a new idea in that regard. But I want to suggest that we want to define, we need to define the system uh, much more concretely and much more effectively than has been done in the past. And what I want to suggest to you is that uh, the US military has essentially escaped uh, the blame for these wars uh, and that it has been instead blamed on political figures, the president primarily, uh, both during the Cold War and since, the president has been essentially the one who has been regarded as responsible for these wars. Now, I, I don't want to suggest that uh, these presidents should bear no responsibility. Obviously they do bear responsibility. That's their job to make decisions uh, about uh, US uh, military force, the use of military force among many other decisions. But I wanna to suggest to you that, that we've had a situation over both the Cold War period and since, in which the politics of national security in this country were such that uh, no president could make a decision about the use of force without considering the political consequences of opposing what the military wanted. And in a few minutes, in a very few minutes, I wanna give you a, a few instances of this. Uh, but, but I think the problem has been 
certainly during the Cold War and in the wars that we have, the big wars that we fought uh, in the post-Cold War period, the problem has been that, that presidents have lacked the courage to stand up to uh, the military uh, in, in a number of instances. And uh, so I wanna begin with the, the definition of the problem of the role of the military in uh, the, the policy of the United States with regard to national security and wars in general. And I think it's not sufficiently realized just how much power the US military acquired from the very beginning of the Cold War and power that they held on to obviously once the Cold War was over. A power to define the broad outlines of US policy uh, around the world in terms of the stationing of forces uh, and commitments to uh, so-called allies to use force as well as the actual use of force itself. Um, and I wanna go back to the very beginning, the early period of the Cold War for a moment and talk to you about uh, a fact which was new to me in my uh, research. I was not aware of this until very recently that the rearmament program that took place between 1950 and 1952, which changed the entire character of the Cold War, militarized it to an extreme degree, uh, was the result of a deception which was carried out by uh, Paul Nitze, one of the great hawks of the Cold War uh, and his State Department allies, uh, as well as the Joint Chiefs of Staff at that time. And the role that the Joint Chiefs played in this deception, which made it possible to get the rearmament uh, program, was that they came up with a, uh, uh, a phony intelligence assessment that was integral to the famous NSC 68 document, which launched the militarized uh, era of the Cold War, uh, and which has been credited with changing the, the nature of the Cold War by historians, uh, that was integral to that document. And uh, it, was, it was a fake. It was a, uh, an assessment which they made up uh, out of whole cloth and which uh, represented the view that the, the Soviet Union wanted to and was intending to invade Central Europe, uh, Western Europe by force, uh, something that they had absolutely no evidence of and which uh, CIA uh, analysts who were independent of the military had uh, repeatedly essentially renounced uh, and said it wasn't true, there was no evidence of it. And, and so this was the beginning of uh, a Cold War period in which the Joint Chiefs of Staff played a very key role, which has been underplayed in the history of the Cold War. But as I have researched this in, in the last year or so, uh, I have found that the key turning points in the Cold War, including the Vietnam War and the resumption of the Cold War after detente uh, under the Carter administration were engineered by coalitions that included crucially the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Joint Chiefs of Staff played crucial roles uh, in those uh, turning points. And, uh, on the Vietnam War, uh, most people are unaware of the fact that the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, decided that they would support the stationing of US troops in South Vietnam in 1961, because as they told uh, a historian who was interviewing them later on, they believed that it would help them get more uh, in the military budget under the uh, Kennedy administration. Um, and of course it did in fact, increase the military budget, uh, the, mil the, the uh, Vietnam War uh, uh, very strongly increased the military budget, but that was the uh, motivation that they admitted to long after the fact. Uh, and the Joint Chiefs of Staff then played a key role in the, um, uh, the deception of uh, Lyndon Johnson over the Gulf of Tonkin uh, incident because they, along with people in the State Department and others, essentially rigged up a very complex plan to try to bring about a, an attack on U.S. ships in the Gulf of Tonkin, 
Uh, they did succeed and get the North Vietnamese to make one attack, but Lyndon Johnson refused to retaliate. And then when another attack was alleged uh, and, and one of the ships claimed that they thought they were under attack, but then later changed their mind, um, the Secretary of Defense uh, then uh, did not tell Lyndon Johnson that, that there had not been uh, evidence of an attack. It was, uh, it was a call that had been, re uh, had been reconsidered. And as a result, Lyndon Johnson believed that there had been a second attack. So uh, there, there's a whole history here that I'm beginning to uncover of deceptions that make up the spine, if you will, of the Cold War. And of course, uh, I think all of you are much more familiar with the uh, series of deceptions that have taken place in the post-war period, post-Cold War period, which have allowed the military to carry out wars in Iraq, uh, in Iraq and in Afghanistan, uh, which I've covered in my own writing as a journalist. Now, uh, it's very important, uh, uh, very quickly, I wanna outline uh, the reality that we, uh, that we face in terms of the nature of the military services. They are often, mistakenly regarded as uh, public servants of uh, the American people, even though wrongheaded and in many cases committing terrible acts in wars. Uh, the fact is that they are self-interested, self-serving institutions, which act more like private enterprises than they do uh, public servants or public institutions. And this goes all the way back to the beginning, as I say, of the Cold War they have shown over and over again that their first consideration is taking care of their own vested interests, their own primary interests, which are first of all, to ensure the maximum amount of budgetary resources uh, annually. And secondly, uh, to maximize their power over policy, uh, to make sure that the policy is going to continue to be oriented towards conflict with uh, one or more uh, particularly if possible, uh, several uh, uh, enemies or adversaries so that they can continue to justify the high level of, of uh, budgetary resources that they've been getting annually. And so, so what they are uh, always concerned with is maintaining the status quo or even uh, jumping up or, or increasing the level of tension in order to uh, make sure that the present status quo of their power and resources is not reversed. They accomplished and, that in, uh, very successfully during the Cold War. They've been accomplishing it again in the post-Cold War period. Uh, so so in, uh, what, what I want to conclude with is the suggestion that uh, it, it's important to become better acquainted with the concept of a self-serving US military uh, set of institutions, that this is the heart of the problem, always has been and will continue to be. And that is as well, I think, the heart of the solution to it, because I think a movement is going to have to be mounted that attacks the military uh, and its behavior uh, and its role precisely because uh, they are self-serving institutions, not institutions that have been serving the interests of the American people. And, and instead, they have in fact endangered the safety of the American people over and over again, both during the Cold War and since then. During the Cold War, particularly I would emphasize over their willingness to uh, have the American public be exposed to the risk of nuclear war. Uh, mm -hmm. they did so during the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. They uh, did so again in the Reagan administration uh, with a very provocative uh, policy toward the Soviet Union. Uh, and of course, uh, in the post-Cold War period, they have uh, endangered the safety of Americans by uh, carrying out policies that uh, essentially, instead of being counter-terrorists, uh, really encourage terrorism uh, over and over again. Uh, one of the themes that I've been talking about in my own writing as a journalist. One so minute. that's it. That's all I want to say. Thank you. <laughs> Gareth, thank you so much. I know you have a lot more to say on this. Hopefully we'll get at that in some of the questions. Paul Norsey, do you have some questions for Gareth? 
Yeah, th thanks, Gareth. Thanks, thanks, Sandra. Um, there's a couple of questions here in the chat box. I'll uh, read them off. Um, the first one is from Alfeca. Um, uh, the question is, what is your view, what in your view underlies US hegemony and militarism? Democrats and Republicans in Congress rush to give the military money in the budget with little questions asked. Are they taking kickbacks? If the money was cut off, the, mil the military would wither. And this is from Alfeca, an economist. Uh, that's, that's a great question. It's, it's really crucial, a crucial question to analyze and understand. And, and it is, it's a bit complicated because it involves uh, a system in which Congress has clearly been bought off by uh, the, the uh, uh, contractors who are the primary allies of the military services. Um, and, and those contractors, of course, dispose of enormous amounts of money and use that uh, to support con uh, members of Congress or uh, candidates for Congress who are going to be reliable supporters of their military budget uh, interests. Um, and uh, so that's, that's the heart of the problem. And then you have uh, a, an organization of Congress in which um, you know, the, the committees uh, that uh, sit in judgment on military budgets and military policy are all staffed or, or are peopled by members who, uh, of course, are the ones who were bought off by uh, the contractors. Um, and so it, it does, uh, it presents a very uh, severe challenge uh, to a movement of uh, activists to try to change it. I don't have uh, any easy answer to this, uh, except that you know, we face a very long uh, task, uh, complicated task of educating ourselves and then educating the public. And of course that, that brings up the whole problem of, of uh, media and uh, having a much more effective uh, uh, media uh, system to challenge the uh, corporate media. That's part of the problem as well. But the, it begins with self-education uh, and, and sort of storing up uh, a set of arguments to challenge the uh, military as well as uh, the system of contractors that support them. But, but I think we have to take on the military as well because they have been uh, given a sort of uh, uh, elevated status as above the fray in the political system of the United States, and that has to end. Okay, uh, thanks. Um, there's another question here in the chat box from Nathan. Uh, the question is, where can I read more about the Joint Chiefs of Staff admitting that they placed troops in South Vietnam in order to increase the budget, their yeah. budget? Yeah. Uh, that's a good question too. Uh, I'm, I'm writing a book right now which will cover that deception uh, or that part of a broader deception, as well as a, a longer panoply of, of military deceptions during and after the Cold War. But uh, it, it was originally uh, published in a book by a, um, a former Pentagon official. Um, and uh, I'd be glad to uh, help the person get the reference if he wants to contact me. Uh, through uh, through your organization, that'd be fine. Okay, we'll we'll try to follow up with that. I, I guess um, there's another question here from Anchor. Uh, the question is: Do you think abolishing the CIA would be a major step towards this goal? Last time this was seriously considered in our discourse was a GOP member in Congress proposing a bill to do so in 2005. Well, I'm all for basically getting rid of the CIA's uh, covert operations. That I think is the heart of it, of course. I'm not sure that it would be a good idea to uh, abolish the CIA's analytical core. Uh, uh, in my book, uh, in my, the pub book that I'm writing right now, um, you know, I'm using uh, information which is extremely valuable that CIA uh, analysts published, not published, but, but put in their reporting during the Eisenhower and Kennedy administrations about the Soviet Union, which was exactly the opposite of what was being said publicly by the military 
uh, and its allies in the national security state. So this is just by way of saying that it's, it's been very important that they have often told the truth uh, about the situation. Uh, you know, very often they have not, but there, but there are situations where they have uh, valuable anal uh, analyses that we want to keep going. Okay. Um, according to the National Priorities Project, the total cost of wars to U.S. taxpayers since 2001 is over $5.4 trillion, $5 trillion and is continuing at a rate of over $32 million per hour. As you have noted, uh, and I'll add, you've noted the military, but I'll say as Eisenhower actually once called it initially, it's published as military industrial complex, but I think he actually initially intended to say military industrial congressional complex, but was convinced to leave out congressional because he needed Congress to help pass some bills that he wanted. Um, Congress is a huge part of this because they hold the purse strings. Um, and so in the, back to the question, the military industrial congressional complex has relied on deliberate and systematic deception propagated through mass media to deflect or shut down any criticism or questioning of the blo bloated and unauditable military budget. Can you give us some ideas of what are some of the biggest and most common deceptions that are currently circulating to support wars in the mass media? And what are some of the news sources that are worst and best in terms of propagating such deception or seeking truth respectively? Wow, I hope you have another half an hour. Uh, just joking, but uh, that, that's a big one. Um, let's see, the first part of it is, um, uh, let's see now, oh, I, I, I got sandbagged on the- uh, Paul, give him a bo some bullets, go one by one with so, the bullets. So, <laughs> yeah, ba basically, what are some of the biggest and most common deceptions right. currently that deceptions. are prevent or that Congress or the media is using to support right. the ongoing wars, which there are twenty five of them right now, right? Yes. Something like that. Well, I mean, the the first thing, of course, is that the media uh, constantly um, upholds the official view of our adversaries um, and uh, essentially justifies whatever the Pentagon and the military are doing by uh, sort of constantly reiterating the talking points that they are given, whether it's in one document or in uh, you know, a constant flow of information uh, from the Pentagon and the military about uh, you know, the Soviet Union, China, Iran, and North Korea, the, the major um, uh, adversaries, which are of course, the fundamental building blocks of the military budget. And so the system really relies on, uh, survives on uh, ensuring that the Congress and the media continue to uphold the official line that these uh, four or five uh, adversaries are truly threatening uh, the, the safety, uh, the security of, of the United States and the American people. And uh, once you really probe into the, uh, the guts of this argument, you find, of course, that it is a deception. That was uh, at the heart of the deception of the Cold War about the Soviet Union. Uh, it is still the heart of the deception today. Um, and, and I would say, um, you know, another deception that I, comes to mind immediately is that the United States must invest in uh, uh, constantly renewing its capabilities for being able to fight wars near our adversaries, not close to the United States, but near our adversaries, near the Soviet Union, near China, near Iran, and near North Korea. Uh, why is that? Because we know that, you know, these wars are going to be fought by the United States decision. It's going to be a U.S. initiative it's not going to be a defensive war. But they cover that by uh, claiming that our adversaries are being unfair by having strategies that make it impossible for the United States to have a military presence or be effective militarily close to their shores. 
And, and so that's, that's such an obvious deception that it needs to be completely exploded. And, uh, you know, there, there's a lot to be done in that regard. Okay. Um, I think I have time for one more question. Um, the biggest expenditure of our tax money for foreign aid is $3.8 billion in military aid to Israel each year, according to the BBC, despite Israel's illegal military occupation, settler colonialism, ethnic cleansing, and apartheid. Can you please discuss some of the common deceptions that are propagated to justify supporting such human rights violations and war crimes? Well, I think the, the simple answer to that, uh, because we don't have uh, a lot of time, is that uh, you, you have US uh, administrations that are um, beholden to the Israeli lobby um, and beholden to, to uh, the Israeli government. Um, and, and they are uh, invariably going to support whatever that government does uh, and cover it up. I mean, we have seen how uh, when the Israelis uh, carried out uh, a, uh, a cleansing operation, uh, essentially ethnic cleansing in Jerusalem, um, it was it passed virtually unnoticed in terms of uh, the Biden administration. They said nothing about it. And then when there was a response by the uh, Palestinians, uh, there was a response from the uh, from the Biden administration. And that's I think that's um, the essential problem that we face here: that that there is an automatic support politically for Israel, no matter what they do. Um, and we'll, we'll wring our hands a little bit when there's a, a, an egregious human rights violation as there has been very recently, but essentially uh, nothing is gonna be done because it's a, it's a structural problem. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry to say that we have in this country politically because the, uh, the Israeli lobby uh, disposes of so much money, controls uh, Congress, essentially has a, a, a arguably a, a majority in both houses of Congress uh, ready to uh, act uh, at its uh, behest. And so um, uh, we are up against a, uh, a more fundamental political problem, which has been long in the making and, and will require a long time to, to uh, write. But, but I must say that there is very strong evidence that the, there's change on the way in regard to the attitude towards Israel, because now it is no longer a crime to say that Israel is an apartheid state. Uh, it is accepted more broadly. Uh, you can't get away with accusing somebody of being anti-Semitic because of that. So I think we are in a process of very rapid change that uh, it offers some hope uh, in regard to changing the policy toward Israel. Go ahead, Paul. Let's take another question or two. We have a little time. Um. I don't see any more in the chat box, but I have another one I could bring up. Um, okay, let's take that one. So in, in addition to waging wars in 25 countries since 2001, our, our government has also imposed or supported crippling sanctions that are effectively collective punishment against, um, uh, uh, against hundreds, of thousands, hundreds of millions of civilians in places like Iran, Yemen, Syria, Lebanon, Gaza, Cuba, and Venezuela, among others. Collective punishment is a war crime under the Fourth Geneva Convention, Article 33. Can you discuss some of the deceptions that are used to deflect or shut down any criticism or questioning of these sanctions? Yes, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to address one in particular, thank you. Uh, which, which again uh, traces back ultimately to the Israeli government. And that is the whole idea that Iran represents a threat uh, to get nuclear weapons um, and that the United States must continue to put maximum pressure in some fashion on Iran through its uh, sanctions, its economic sanctions against Iran, which have been very pernicious and uh, have really began during the Clinton administration. They've been going for more than 30 years now. Uh, and, and the Israelis have uh, influenced the US policy for that length of time and have created a whole uh, uh, legal structure in this country, which has to be uh, addressed 
in order to essentially escape from this uh, uh, system of sanctions, which controls our policy now toward Iran. Uh, and, uh, and I'm afraid we are on the way towards trying to duplicate that with regard to China as well. So I think that um, you know, we face a problem of reversing uh, decades of uh, political influence by those who want to control US policy, particularly on the Middle East. Um, and uh, this is going to demand a lot of, again, a lot of education uh, and, and work to devise a strategy that has not been tried yet, but which is going to have to be tried to push it back. Gareth, thank you so much. Uh, your comments have been, again, very revelatory and uh, disturbing, but we needed to hear it. And I thank you so much for joining us tonight and uh, to tell us about the deception behind, I guess, the, the underlying lie, the big lie between the military, industrial, congressional, national security state. And uh, I hope you will can stay in touch and uh, keep us informed of, and if it becomes obvious that there is some action that you think or lobbying effort we can make, let us know so we can try really, to move my on promise. that. You have my promise on that. Good. Okay, everybody, I want to, uh, uh, on behalf of our organization, I want to thank our outstanding speakers for providing us in-depth insight into topics that uh, too little is known about, about which too little is known or frankly addressed. And uh, I thank everybody for participating, joining us. Uh, our meeting is concluded here. We thank you for coming and we hope to see you at our next meeting. Good night, everybody. Oh, wait, I do have one thing. Uh, one of our members tonight has asked to make an announcement. Let me see if I can find Natalie here, if she's still here. Natalie, I am going to ask you to unmute so you can, you wanted to make an announcement. Are you there? Trying to get you unmuted. Anything, Natalie? Okay, maybe we lost her. <laughs> With that in mind, uh, if... Uh, I guess Natalie's no longer there. All right, then back to where I was. Uh, thanks for coming. See you at the next meeting. Good night, everyone. Good night, Sandra. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Hi, thank you.